Hello and welcome to another video trying to get you the top grades. Today I'm going to focus on what I hope will be the 2019 question, the relationship between Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. And as usual in this series, I'm only going to use these nine quotations to show you how they fit any question. Well, my thesis is going to start with Lady Macbeth, and I'm going to argue that she is the more dominant character in the marriage. Macbeth has the more dominant position, because this is a patriarchal society, and it almost deifies him as a warrior, as we see in the battle against Norway. However, the real strength in the marriage is Lady Macbeth. I'm also going to argue that Macbeth exploits her strength he uses her power in order to become more powerful himself. And then once that happens, the consequences of what she does in unsexing herself forces him, in his own mind, to abandon her as being too masculine and too powerful. So we see this first in Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers. Lady Macbeth's first action on hearing the Weird Sisters prophecies is to seek to become less female because females have no power in this patriarchal society and she wants to throw over the traditional role of a woman which is to be a mother and therefore she takes away her breast milk and she seeks the power to commit murder. Now this she sees as a masculine power which leads her to be unsexed. But another way of looking at this is it is an extraordinary sacrifice she's making. She's taking her femininity and sacrificing it for her husband to give him the prize of kingship that, she, that he wants. However, this quotation also shows us that she's still producing breast milk. Her child has therefore only recently died and we can have great sympathy for her seeing that she's acting out of grief. This is a great psychological burden, and she imagines becoming queen might fill this hole in her psyche. Now, when Macbeth arrives, she has to give him some advice. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. Now, this is a really interesting metaphor. The flower, of course, is a feminine symbol. So, just as she has instructed the murdering ministers to make her more male, she's instructing Macbeth to become less male, at least on the surface. She's actually trying to feminise him. So, we could see this as Shakespeare's critique on the patriarchy of his day, and suggesting that we need a greater balance between the warrior male and the mother figure female. You know, that men and women shouldn't be defined by these roles but should be able to explore both sides of their personality. Lady Macbeth, however, suggests this only for evil gains. So she's suggesting that he becomes feminine on the surface in order to beguile the time, in order to deceive, and then he's going to become the snake underneath it, that symbol of Satan. So Macbeth doesn't recoil from this imagery and this reference to um, the serpent from the Garden of Eden. So he is just as evil as his wife. He is just as committed to the murder, at least in theory. Now this invites us to ask why he sent Lady Macbeth a letter in the first place, telling her of what the witches had prophesied, because we see him arrive on stage, and therefore to his castle, only minutes after the letter has arrived. So what's in his psychology here? Well, I'd like to suggest that he writes the letter to Lady Macbeth because he knows she is the more dominant partner in the marriage, and he knows that that brief time with the letter will allow her to start planning how he can become king. He knows that he is too feminine in some ways, he is too kind, to actually carry through his desire to kill Duncan. But he also knows that his wife is, if you like, more evil than he is, or at least more brave 
in defying God and convention, and he believes that she'll come up with a plan that will help them both succeed. So it's very easy to have a reading of Macbeth where we see Lady Macbeth as like Eve and therefore much worse in her temptation of Macbeth and kind of manipulating Macbeth into this regicide. But I think the letter shows something different. It shows that Macbeth invites her to come up with this plan. And if we look at the marriage a little further, there is an element of cynicism when he then abandons her once the plan is complete. Perhaps we get our first clue that he might abandon his wife when he first meets the witches. So let's go back to Banquo's words. If you can see into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not, speak then to me, who neither beg nor fear your favours. So this is Banquo asking to know his own fate from the witches. He wants to know his own destiny. Now, this is a massive cue to Macbeth to find out Lady Macbeth's destiny. But he does not ask. Now, we can use that to show that, ultimately, he's much more interested in himself and not his wife. And so we can argue that his relationship with his wife is one of an unequal exploitation. He uses her greater mental resolve to stiffen his own resolve, but ultimately he does not fully care for what happens to her. Or we can take a more charitable and loving view and say that he just assumes that becoming queen will fulfil her ultimate ambitions and she will simply be happy um, with that. So you have a choice here of whether to see this moment as a moment of neglect and self-interest where uh, Macbeth has the opportunity to ask what will happen to his wife but doesn't, or you can see it as a simply loving assumption that his wife will want to be queen and that this will be enough. At the beginning, once they've killed Duncan, he takes Lady Macbeth still into his confidence and says, we have scorched the snake, not killed it. And I'd want to emphasise the word we here. At this stage, he still sees his life with Lady Macbeth as a partnership. And indeed, when he wrote the letter to her, he called her my dearest partner in greatness. So there was a promise that he wouldn't treat her as an inferior. However, at this stage in the play, having killed Banquo, we remember that he did not include Lady Macbeth in his plans. Instead, he told her to be innocent of the knowledge. So one interpretation of that is that he wants to prevent her um, from feeling the same guilt that he has. But another interpretation is that he's now excluding her from power. He is denying her a voice. And the same happens here. He doesn't invite her to give him any solutions to how they can kill the snake. He keeps his plans secret and to himself. And I'd like to argue that from this moment onwards, the power relationship in his marriage changes completely. And we can see that in the banquet scene where Banquo's ghost appears and Lady Macbeth is forced to take charge but ends up turning on her husband and calling him a coward. And I think there's an irreparable break there because she feminises him again. By calling him a coward, she's reminding us of this flower image. Uh, she's making him less powerful and more female. And by definition, she is promoting her own power as above his. And I think this causes a schism in the relationship, a break, and it forces Macbeth away. So you have a choice of arguing whether that's Lady Macbeth's fault for turning on her husband in this way, or whether it's Macbeth's um, plan from the beginning to gradually exclude his wife from power. So I'd like to argue that Shakespeare presents the breakdown in the marriage as a kind of tragedy, because we've seen that the two are perfectly matched. At the beginning, they understood each other perfectly, and Macbeth used his knowledge of Lady Macbeth's um, evil desires and mental strength to get her to help him kill Duncan when he had misgivings. But look what happens when he goes to kill Duncan. Is this a dagger I see before me? 
or but a dagger of the mind. This, if you like, is the moment that his mind starts to disintegrate. And the dagger appears as a warning. It doesn't just appear to signal that Duncan lies ahead and this is the way that Macbeth must go in order to kill him. It appears as a warning of what's happening to his mind at the moment he decides to commit the regicide. There are numerous instances of Macbeth losing that sense of sanity, uh, which we see once he's killed Banquo, and uh, he sees Banquo's ghost, which comes back to haunt him. And it's not necessarily the guilt of Banquo that's um, haunting him, but the knowledge that Banquo has survived through Fleance, and therefore his threat has survived, and therefore the snake is still powerful. Lady Macbeth's mind is affected in exactly the same way. She also suffers for her, from hallucinations, although we could argue that they're less powerful than Macbeth's because they happen only in her sleep, whereas they happen in Macbeth's waking hours. So Lady Macbeth imagines that there is a damned spot of blood still on her hand, which she can no longer get rid of. This, of course, is a symbol of her guilt, but it's also a symbol of her religious belief she still thinks that her soul is going to be damned. Um, now, Macbeth doesn't ever talk in religious terms. Uh, he talks about Duncan going to heaven or to hell, but he never imagines for one moment that hell is real for his own soul. It's not even a concern to him. So, to a Shakespearean audience, this might well suggest that Macbeth is more mad than his wife, at least in terms of um, the Christian belief of the time, the audience will have some sympathy for her because she's still a Christian, whereas Macbeth has departed entirely from Christian belief. He no longer seems to believe in God, and doesn't believe in hell and divine punishment. Now this is so powerful because a person who doesn't believe that their soul is going to go to hell doesn't believe that he has to fear any kind of punishment in the afterlife and therefore can carry out any act in life believing that they can get away with it. So it's worth considering Shakespeare's purpose here. So he could be suggesting that Lady Macbeth needs to be punished because she has transgressed against the patriarchal society. She's gone against what the role of a woman should be. Macbeth, on the other hand, is punished for going against God. And therefore, his sin is seen as far worse and his suffering appears to be greater. So his psychological suffering happens during waking hours as opposed to Lady Macbeth's when she's asleep as a reflection of the great sin that he has committed in regicide. Uh, Shakespeare's purpose is obviously to show all the nobles at court that committing regicide is wrong. And this is a really real political message that he's got. It's uh, easy to forget that Macbeth wasn't performed first at the theatre. It was performed for all the nobles at King James's court, at his palace. And therefore it has not just an entertainment value, but it carries a real political message. And we know historically that there were many um, nobles who would have been thinking of getting rid of King James, um, and we can see proof of that in the gunpowder plot and this huge assassination attempt by the Catholics. So Shakespeare is tapping into that very real political fear that James would have had that people were out to dethrone him, to usurp him, to assassinate him. And he's providing this propaganda in the play through the marriage um, to show that they shouldn't. However, he's much more interested in the psychology of relationships uh, because that plot could have played out entirely with Macbeth killing Duncan. We didn't need a Lady Macbeth at all in the story. Uh, but Shakespeare is profoundly interested in how women are portrayed in society and he seems to offer Lady Macbeth the opportunity to escape this role of the mother and then takes that opportunity away from her. And the question you have to ask yourself as a reader here is does he do that in order to criticise Lady Macbeth for daring to challenge society or is he attacking society for its repression of women? 
The sleepwalking scene also tells us a number of other things about the marriage. First, it shows us how Macbeth has abandoned his wife. He's no longer sleeping with her. And consequently, he has not heard the words that she says when she's sleepwalking. So, here's the smell of blood still. All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. Um, he knows that these words in her sleepwalking speech are a confession. Um, well, he would know if he heard them. But the proof that he hasn't heard them is that he's invited the doctor to come and try and cure her mental troubles. So this shows perhaps that he no longer trusts his wife to be his equal. Um, it also shows that he sees his role as a king to be far superior to his wife. But there is still an act of love here. He's really trying to make his wife have much better mental health. Now, this isn't a phrase that Shakespeare would have used, um, but he does talk about the root and sorrow of the mind. He wants to give her mind peace. This is a proof that he still loves her. And moreover, this happens just before he's going to be invaded by Malcolm. And he's got a really strong suspicion that they're going to be victorious and defeat him. Uh, but he still chooses in his last hours to think of his wife. Now, there's something incredibly loving and incredibly powerful about that. He now realises that he needs to protect her uh, because he's seen her, if you like, become much more feminine. And the irony is, although she asked to become much more masculine, the reverse has happened. And so if we focus in on these words, you'll see how she portrays her hand as little. That feminises her again, and it also conveys how little power she feels she has now in this society. Now that could also be, of course, a reflection of how little power Macbeth has given her, and therefore he is, if you like, responsible for her decline in mental health. Now, another question to ask is, who's she talking to in the sleepwalking scene? And actually, we can make a really strong case that she's not talking to herself, but she's actually talking to Macbeth. Uh, so I'd like to present the sleepwalking scene as evidence that the couple still really love each other, but the regicide has come between them and caused an irreparable rift. I'd like to argue that Shakespeare does this in order to point out the great sadness of what's happened. They did have a perfect marriage. They were perfectly suited. And we again see that with the hallucinations that they both have once the regicide has been carried through. But doing that has meant that the love they have between them is no longer enough. And their marriage is destroyed, even though they still love each other. Consequently, when uh, Lady Macbeth has died, Macbeth's reaction it might appear without feeling. Tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day. It's a really odd thing to talk about how slow time is, when actually in many ways it's speeded up with the suicide of Lady Macbeth and Malcolm's army coming to attack him. So what's happening here... So what's happening is Macbeth giving up on life. The death of Lady Macbeth has caused him to criticise the slowness of time because he wants it to accelerate and lead to his eventual death. He doesn't know how that's going to happen because of the witch's prophecies, but he's actually had enough. He does not want to face life on his own, and he's ready to join his wife in death, but because he's a warrior... He wants to die in battle. Ultimately, I'd like to argue that Shakespeare uses the marriage to say that there are two possible approaches to life. And Macbeth chooses this interpretation. It is a nihilistic approach. Uh, that's how you spell it. And it means that there is no point to life. So everything that seems fair, like Lady Macbeth, like the promise of kingship, turns out to be foul. She turns out to be evil, and becoming king turns out to be a prize that's worthless. Now, of course, a belief in God will turn what is foul, uh, the circumstances of your life, 
into something fair, the promise of everlasting life in heaven, so long as you're a good person. But Macbeth doesn't believe that. He simply believes that life is what you make it, and that is a nihilistic view if you think that that life is then pointless. And he dies feeling that. So perhaps Macbeth's ultimate punishment is a nihilistic view, this kind of despair that he dies with, knowing that there is nothing afterwards. Shakespeare contrasts that with the despair that Lady Macbeth has, which is the opposite of nihilistic. She doesn't believe that life is pointless, as we saw with the um, description of her damned soul. She believes that there is an afterlife, and she has wasted the future of her soul in order to try and achieve something magnificent in life. At the end of the play, we can argue that he wants us to feel much more sympathy for Lady Macbeth, but this sympathy is denied her by Macbeth and also by Shakespeare. He refuses to put her death on stage where we might feel the full emotional force of it and removes it in order to show that Macbeth does not allow himself that emotional force to take effect. It does take an effect because it leads to his despair and giving up on life, but it doesn't reflect in real grief for his lost love. Perhaps this suggests that he didn't love her enough, or it suggests that it was so overwhelming that he's now giving up on life once she's departed. You have to decide in your answer, and weighing the two up will give you a more sophisticated response. The final thing you can argue is that her death offstage reflects how society excludes women. The patriarchy simply focuses on the men and what happens to Macbeth and does not focus in any way on what happens to Lady Macbeth as a symbol of how unimportant female power is. You then have the opportunity of saying, well, does this prove Shakespeare is criticising society or is he supporting society's patriarchal view of women? I personally prefer the interpretation where he wants us to be sympathetic to Lady Macbeth and therefore he is attacking the patriarchal society. So, at using this quotation at the end of your essay will show that you are highly conceptualised. You haven't just followed things through in... Um, chronological order. You've thought about the best order to use these quotations. Amazingly, I've written this essay with only nine quotations, the same nine that I'll use for every essay. They're not necessarily the best quotations um, to talk about Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, but that doesn't matter. I'm trying to show you how just picking nine quotations and forcing yourself to think originally about them will force you to write a conceptualised and interesting response. And that will force the examiners to give you top grades. You can, of course, include lots of other quotations that you remember in your essay. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing that. But uh, I really hope you've seen how to get grade 9 by concentrating on just 9 quotations. As usual, good luck in getting your grades 7, 8 and 9. If you want more videos like this, don't forget to subscribe. See you soon on my channel.